Is there anybody in here that doesn't know the difference between right and wrong? We all know, don't we? Do we have to go to church to know that? Or is that something that's just in us, innate in us? We all know. So let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 11 this morning. Matthew's going to introduce us this morning to John the Baptist. And um, John was quite a very unique individual. I don't know if all many of you have looked at John very much, but uh, his ministry was very unique. And We're going to take a look at that this morning. How many of you know that it was John the Baptist that baptized Jesus, right? Um, So that's when we, you know, we're kind of first introduced to him, the story of John and how he was born, and and, uh, he was uh, uh, born to a couple who were older and beyond childbearing age, and you know, isn't that like the Lord to do something like that, you know? So many times in Scripture you see that, that miracle take place where people are way beyond childbearing years, but yet God gives them a child. And, and, and when he does that, uh, he does that for a specific reason, a specific purpose. He has a calling on that child's life. And there's many certain, many. Uh, examples of that throughout Scripture, but John was one of the uh, greatest examples. So let's, let's pick up the story in chapter 11, and we'll read the first six verses here to get started. It says, It came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples, that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ... He sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who was not offended because of me. So, you know, John, it's amazing when you think about when in in the Gospel of John, uh, in chapter 1, I want to read the account of when John and Jesus met there at the Jordan Uh, In chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And John gave this testimony that he saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. He says, I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptize with water told me that the man you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. And the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When you read this account in the Gospel of John, and you read the account that we have here in the Gospel of Matthew, it's amazing to see the contradiction that's there. In the Gospel of John, it would appear that Uh, John the Baptist 
is fully convinced and knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that this was the promised Messiah, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So let me ask you a question. What happened? What happened? Why is now John doubting this? Why is it that John being in prison, why is it that he is sending messengers now to Jesus to ask Jesus, should I be looking for someone else? Did I promote the wrong person? I think that was a very concerning thing to John because I don't think circumstances were working out the way he thought they would. I think John had totally different expectations of what Jesus was going to do when he arrived and began his ministry on the earth. Now in Matthew 3, um, we can hear the words of uh, uh, John in chapter 3, verse 10, where he said, The axe is already at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. But now John finds himself in prison. He's going to be executed. And Jesus has not mounted any type of revolt, any kind of rebellion. He has made no plans to overthrow Rome. And it would appear that maybe John, like some of the other disciples, was disillusioned concerning the peaceful nature of Jesus' ministry. You know, I think that there were other of the apostles who had the idea that when Jesus came the first time, that he was going to come to overthrow Rome, to reestablish Israel as the center of the earth, Jerusalem as the city of God, once again. But Jesus is talking about peace. And, And these things don't seem to be happening. And here he is sitting in prison wondering... Have I made a mistake? It's amazing to me how circumstances uh, can so quickly bend our thinking. It's amazing to me how we can have certain expectations in our own lives. You know, many times in our world and in our society today, we have expectations that good will overcome evil that people's eyes would be open and they would come to see the light. And we put so much effort and hope into that. And then it seems that we wake up one morning and it's worse than it was before. And we kind of start wondering, what's going on? Am I disillusioned? Am I seeing things wrong? Do I need a course correction here? But the idea that, that, that... Jesus wants John to know, and you'll notice how he answers John. He answers him with Scripture. Now, the Scripture that he's referring to here is found in Isaiah 61. And you may remember that when Jesus was in synagogue in Nazareth, that he was, he was allowed to get up and to read the, the passage of the day. You know, we do that every Sunday morning here. We have a verse that we read, and we read it together. And uh, during Jesus' time, that was a, a practice that they had where someone would get up and they would open up the scrolls and they would read from it. Jesus was given the honor to do that. And so he opened up the scroll of Isaiah. And he began to read from chapter 61, and this is what he read. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. 
He has, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God and to comfort all who mourn. And then he looked at the congregation and he said, Today these things have been fulfilled in your ears. In other words, I'm the guy that Isaiah is talking about. And they were blown away by it. And he quietly rolled the scroll up and he went and sat back down and people were looking at each other going, what was that? Who's this guy think he is? This is, this is you know, Mary's son. This is Joseph's son, the carpenter. And he's standing up here reading these things and telling us that it's fulfilled in my ear today. Well, it was written many, many, many years before Jesus was ever born. Now, this particular prophecy in Isaiah is kind of interesting because Jesus only read half of it. He didn't read the whole prophecy. And if you were to go home and do your homework and open up to this prophecy, you would find out that the rest of the prophecy speaks of the Lord coming and ruling and reigning and establishing His government. But that wasn't what his mission was when he came the first time. The second part of the prophecy won't be fulfilled until he comes back again. And so he purposely stopped right where he did. Because this was his calling. This was why he came. If you look at some of the reasons that he speaks of here. He's anointed to preach the good news to the poor. Does that mean the financially poor? Well... Could be. But we know in the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And you know, we, we looked at that a while back as we were beginning Matthew, and we saw that it, it seems as though all of us, when we come into this world, when we're born, we're all born poor in spirit. We're all born separated from God because of sin. We're all born in a circumstance where we cannot fulfill that spiritual part of who we are. We're impoverished in our spirit. And until we come to know Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, and the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and dwells in our spirits, it cohabitates with us. He lives in us. But until that time, we are impoverished. And it's a struggle for people to try to fulfill that need in that vacuum that we're born with. And we find people going out and doing all sorts of different things in an attempt to fill that need. But nothing can satisfy. You know, Jesus told the woman at the well, if you drink of that water in the well, you're just going to have to come back tomorrow and get more. You're going to thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I have to give you, the living water, you will never thirst again. So we're not just talking about people on the bottom of the financial, social rung of life here. We're talking about all of us. He came for all of us. And he came to give us good news. You can find Fulfillment in Him. That's the good news. You can be forgiven of your sin in Christ. That's the good news today. It remains the good news. And you know, when we get to heaven, and we're with the Lord for all of eternity, we will always remember the good news. Every time we look at Him, we will be reminded of the good news. We will see the marks in his hands and his feet and on his forehead and on his side and we'll be reminded of the good news forever. Because apart from Christ, there is no salvation. There is no hope. He also said that he was going to come to bind up the brokenhearted. And again, is there anybody in here that's never been brokenhearted? Disappointed? I think, see, this is the beautiful thing because this isn't just... Each one of these things here, it's not just a specific little group of people. It applies to all 
people, all of us, to proclaim freedom to the captives and to release from darkness for prisoners, not people who are necessarily in prison or jail, but we're all prisoners of sin. We're all captives of sin and darkness before the light comes into our lives. I just love the idea that Jesus here is not just speaking of small groups of people throughout time that some of us may be able to say, well, I don't find myself in that group. Well, we are there. We're in there. Every single one of us is in there. And so he, what he's doing here is he's reminding John, look what I'm doing, John. Look what the scripture said concerning me. Go tell him the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed. You know, apart from Jesus, we're blind. Apart from Jesus, we really can't walk life the way we should walk it. Without Jesus, we are all cursed by the leprosy of sin, if you will. Each and every one of us. The dead are raised. We were spiritually dead, and you know what? We've been raised up to life. In Christ. And even though that Jesus was literally healing blind people, raising dead people, cleansing the lepers in, in, right in front of everybody, there was a deeper message to it. This is you. This is me. And this is why I've come. Go remind John of these things. And remind him, blessed is the man who's not offended in me. In other words, John, hang in there. Don't give up. I think that same message resonates for us this morning. Don't give up. Don't lose sight of the goal. He didn't want John to become discouraged because of how his misperception of Jesus was. He wants to realign John's perception here. And sometimes, many times, we need ours realigned also. We tend to look at circumstances, and it tends to kind of knock us here and knock us over there. And we need those moments when the Lord says, I need to realign you, your thinking. It's times like these that we need to be directed to look back to what the Bible says about the issues of life and about the Lord. And when you find yourself in a situation that you don't understand, always fall back on what you do understand. That's a great little proverb for us as believers today. If you find a situation where you don't know, fall back on the things that you do know. And generally, they're very basic things. God is faithful. God has a plan for my life. He loves me. He has my best interest at heart. He's in control even when I'm not in control. And the trials of life, the Bible tells us, can't even begin to compare to the glory of eternal life. And so in verse 7, it says, As they departed, Jesus began to speak to the multitudes and say, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garment? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Very interesting passage there, isn't that? Very interesting. The question as they're leaving, what did you think that you were going out to see? He's going to define John's character and his ministry. 
When he says he wasn't like a reed, he's speaking of like a little blade of grass or maybe a taller reed that wherever the wind blows, it bends in that direction. He said John wasn't like that. John didn't take the temperature of his audience and then craft his message around that to please them. He was stable in his message. He was consistent. He never wavered in his message. And what was his message? Repent. Repent. Change direction. Come before God. Turn and go the other way. And Jesus said he's not wearing fine clothing like a politician. He's not a socialite. He's not royalty. Instead, he wore the simple clothes of an Old Testament prophet. He was the picture of a simple kind of life. His life was unencumbered with the luxury of easy living. It's amazing to me how, how weighed down we get with the idea of easy living. We want it easy. We want the hammock. We want the little cocktail with the umbrella and the sunshine and the palm trees. And we, you know, you know what? Sometimes that really doesn't bring satisfaction to a person's life. Sometimes it's better to hold on to the simple things of life than to be weighed down by the ways of the world. Because that's what the world does. Paul talks about that. He says, you know, we're running a race. And when you run a race, you want to do everything you can do to get anything that might slow you down off. You don't want to wear combat boots when you're running a race, right? You don't want to be wearing a suit of armor when you're running a race. You have seen the uh, image of the little FTD man running and he's got no clothes on, right? Well, that's how Paul referred to this when he was talking about running this race. Don't let the things of the world encumber you and weigh them down, weigh you down. Cast them aside so that you can run the race to win the race. John was like that. And then, you know, sometimes we meet people or we see people or we hear about people and they have nothing. We're so blessed in this country, if you might look at that as being blessed, to have so much. But there are those in other countries that really don't have anything. They don't have plumbing, can you imagine? They don't have electricity. They don't have AC. They, they live in little huts. They live day to day to survive on the sustenance of what God provides for them. But you know what? They're happy. They're fulfilled. They're not weighed down with the worry of the world like the politicians, the kings, the ones that live the easy life. His was a life of an earthy person, I guess you would say. He was a man of poverty. He wasn't trying to impress anybody by how he looked. Wow, that's a big one, isn't it? How many of us stand in the mirror every Sunday morning? I'm going to church to make sure I look right, you know. He didn't care about that. He wore camel's clothing for, for clothes. He wore camel skin. I bet he didn't smell very good. Huh. He didn't care. That wasn't his priorities in life. But his message was consistent. And why did Jesus say he was greater than all the other prophets? Well, think about it. John was the only prophet who received that privilege of introducing the Messiah to the world. He was the only prophet whose mission was to go before Jesus, to begin to open the path for Christ to come in. And he says interesting things about Jesus. He says, he's greater than I. He was before me, but he wasn't before him when it came to time, when it came to age, when it came to birth. 
Mary is still pregnant with Christ when John's already born. So really, John came first in that way. So why did John say he came before me? Because he's eternal. Because he always was. Because he had no beginning. He has no end. Because he's God. He came before all of us. And he said, you know, John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. When John was beheaded, he died under the Old Covenant. When he was executed, he died without the blood of Jesus because it hadn't been shed yet. So he truly was the last of the Old Testament prophets. But yet he says, the least in the kingdom is greater than John. The kingdom of the physical, if you will, is always exceeded by the kingdom of the heavenly. To the least of those experiencing the kingdom of heaven, it is greater than those experiencing the kingdom of humanity. And the kingdom of heaven was put in place by the work of Christ on the cross. It says that he came to his own in the Gospel of John, but his own did not receive him. He came to the Jews. He fulfilled the promise that God gave to Abraham thousands of years before. He actually gave the promise to Adam and Eve in the garden. That's when it began. God promised them that there would be a a king that would come and he would stomp on Satan's neck, that he would have victory over that serpent, that deceiving one. You know, Jesus said something in the Gospel of John. He said, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born by water and the Spirit. Flesh gives flesh to birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. So you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. Well, this is one of those scriptures that is down through the millennia created a lot of division in the, in the church. It's literally broken people up into different groups, this one passage right here. When he said this to Nicodemus, Nicodemus was blown away. Nicodemus didn't even have the ability to understand what Christ was trying to tell him. And you can tell by Nicodemus' response when he said, wait a minute, how can a man enter back in to the womb and be born a second time, to be born again? And you know what? The Lord tried to explain it to him. He tried to give him the reasoning behind what he was saying when he said, hey, Nick, the things that are born of the flesh are flesh. They can never be anything more than that. They're just flesh. And every single one of us are born into it. Every single one of us are born from water, from our mothers. That's one of the very first things that happens when we're born. The water breaks, and we're born of the flesh. It has nothing to do with baptism. It has everything to do with the natural processes of life. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But yet there's that spirit part of us, that void in us. And so the spirit gives birth to the spirit. So you shouldn't be surprised when I tell you, you must be born again. They were very confused about him. In verse 12, it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. That sounds kind of different, doesn't it? They take it by force. It's always been a fight. It's always been a battle. Every single prophet in the Old Testament was ignored, persecuted, murdered, tortured for the truth because of their message. And every one of them went out there by force and gave the... It's not like winning a popularity contest and everybody wants to hear what you have to say. They want to shut you down. They want to silence your voice. 
And if you don't have a little bit of forcefulness in your life, you'll never get the message out. And truly, that's the way it's been all along. He said, for all the prophets in the law, they prophesied until John. So if you're willing to accept it, Jesus said, yes, this is Elijah who is to come. Interesting, because the Old Testament does tell us before the Lord comes back to establish his kingdom upon the earth that Elijah will come and be a forerunner of that event. It hasn't happened yet. But in the time of Jesus, they were looking for Elijah to come. And since they didn't see Elijah, then they were prone not to believe that Jesus was the one. But the Bible is filled with types and shadows. And John was the perfect type of Elijah. He came with the spirit and the power of Elijah. Will Elijah come? He will come. It is yet to happen. But Jesus said, if you can receive this, he is a type of Elijah. Elijah has come. As a matter of fact, in Luke, when the angel appeared to um, John's dad, Zechariah, he said, don't be afraid, Zach. Your prayers have been heard, and your wife Elizabeth is going to bear you a son, and you will give him the name John, and he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drinks, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. And many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and in the power of Elijah." to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John was not a reincarnation of Elijah. John did come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Something to remember there. If you are willing to receive it. And then he goes on to say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We see that many, many times um, throughout the scripture. Wives, have you ever said your husbands have selective hearing? It's a talent, yeah. It's a gift we have. So you know what, ladies, next time that's what you can say. If you have ears to hear, (laughs) you better pay attention, right? My wife never says that to me, though. (laughs) He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He wanted people to hear what he was saying, not just physically, but spiritually. You know, it's one thing to hear the word of the Lord, just hearing it like you're hearing me speak right now, but it's entirely different when we're able to grasp the truth personally and allow it to affect our lives. That's what the word desires to do for each one of us, to affect our lives, to change our lives. This is the only book where it is written of itself that it's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. That's pretty amazing. The word of God is living. And it's one thing to come into church and say, well, that was really a good sermon. But it's a totally another thing to leave here knowing it's the truth of the word that sets me free. That's what's changed in my life. Each and every one of us comes in here facing different challenges in life. All of us do. We've all struggled with temptation during the week. 
We've been faced with decisions, maybe about work, finances, how we'll spend our leisure time. Some sit in the congregation and they have, they're racked with pain, physical pain, emotional distress, loneliness, confusion. People have been rejected. They're guilty. They're insecure. Boy, aren't you glad that we can come together and hear God's word? Every one of us comes through the doors every week with very similar circumstances, but yet very different. The person sitting next to us, we really don't know what they're going through right now. The difficulty that they may have had throughout the week. And every time we teach God's word, yeah, there's history involved in it, but there's also truth involved in it. Every time we teach from the Word, it gives you information, but the Holy Spirit wants it to give us inspiration. We want to be inspired by it. We don't want to just hear it. We want to make an application to our personal lives because of it. It's so much more. And it's amazing to me. I have the honor to stand up here before you open this book, and talk to you about it. And many times, some of you will come up to me when church is over, and you'll say, wow, have you got my house bugged? How is it that you knew exactly what to say to me today? And I will look at you, and I will say, I didn't have a clue. I don't know. I don't have your house bugged. He does. He's got your house bugged. And somehow or another... When the words leave the mouth, the words that we hear, it's God's Holy Spirit that makes it come alive in our lives. He will take that spoken word and he will touch us right at the point of our need this morning. He will take eternal truths and turn that light on in our soul. And it just expels the darkness. It opens our eyes. It helps us to grow and to mature People of God. That's why we put so much emphasis on this Bible every time we come together. It gives us direction during times of confusion. It'll humble us when pride is sneaking in. And it will challenge us to serve God with everything that we have. Without compromise. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Lord says. Verse 16, to what shall I liken this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you, but you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. And the Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, look, he's a glutton, he's a wine-bibber, he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by its children. Wow, what a rebuke to the people here. Jesus has just given them a powerful, glowing testimony about John the Baptist. And there's so much contrast that he charges that generation with rejection of both John and himself. You know, John and Jesus both had ministries. They both had a popularity time in the beginning. And they were rejected by the leaders, both of them, and eventually by all the people. And so he's likening them to little children, looking for someone to play games with them. They wanted to play wedding. See, that's what you do. You know, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. That's what they would do at a wedding. They'd play the flute. People would dance. They would, I'm not going to dance for you. And they would celebrate... He said, but they didn't respond. 
But then on the other hand, here comes John. Here comes John with kind of a hard message of repentance. We mourned for you, but you did not lament. He was a Nazarite who had taken a vow to re, 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 uh, stay away from great foods and frivolous pleasures, but the people reacted to him as though he was a demon. You see the contrast of the two ministries there, right? Jesus had one way of doing it. John had another way of doing it, totally opposite from one another, but they all worked for the same guy. They all had the same boss. They all had the same goal in mind, and that was to proclaim the truth. John's message, repent, come to your senses, open your eyes. You know, I have been in jails, I've been in prisons, I've been in the homeless camps, I've been at the mission, and I've posed the same question to everybody. Is there anybody in here that doesn't know the difference between right and wrong? Anybody? If you don't, raise your hand. We all know, don't we? Do we have to go to church to know that? Or is that something that's just in us, innate in us? We all know. So we are without excuse. Men and women of the world are without excuse because they know and they willingly defy God. And so John is crying out, repent. You know better. Why do we choose to go the wrong way? Because I have a sinful nature. I have the propensity to sin. And sometimes it's in very small, subtle ways. You know, some who sin are really good at it because they can do it inside and nobody notices. Some can have that unforgiveness and that bitterness in their lives, but they can hide it. They can cover it up when they come here for an hour. But as soon as you get home, you're back to mumber and mumbling again about people, complaining. Other people, their sins are on the outside and they're visible. And we see them and we say, oh, drug addict, alcoholic, thief. Which is worse? To be a sinner that shows it openly or to be the one that tries to hide it and pretend that I'm something that I'm not? We all kind of fall in one of those categories. And so Jesus and John, they come and they work together. Repent, John said. And Jesus said, my blood is going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You're going to be born again. You're going to become a brand new person. The old things are going to pass away. And all things are going to become new. I don't know about you, if you have a past that you're not very proud of? Does it haunt you? Do you carry it around with you? Or have we laid it down at the foot of Christ? You know, I think one of the biggest things and one of the biggest challenges for me was to be able to say, yes, Lord, I do accept your forgiveness for me, but I can't forgive myself. You ever deal with that? Yeah, I think Jesus washed me from my sins, but... I'm still walking around feeling guilty and condemned because I can't seem to let go. And the word of God is the very thing that will help us to let go. The very thing that will allow you and I today to know that we are brand new creatures in Christ. We've been recreated. We have a new mind. We think differently. We behave differently. And oh yeah, Oh, yeah, that old nature, it wants to kind of resurrect itself once in a while. And before you had the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you were helpless to do anything about it. You were a slave to it, but not today. We're not slaves to it anymore. Is it still there? Absolutely. But we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And when those ugly things begin to raise their head up again, we have the Holy Spirit. And we can say, no, I choose not to do that, to think like that. I'm choosing to be forgiving to those who have hurt me because I want to be like Jesus. I want to have peace of mind. So on one hand, they're critical of John because he's definitely different. 
On the other hand, they're critical of Jesus because he's a people person. By the way, he was not a glutton. And he wasn't a drunkard. But he was a friend of sinners. He wasn't afraid to go into a sinner's home and eat with them. How do we change people's lives if we always keep our light hidden in our own little world? And we don't let it shine among those who really need to see it. I'm going to have a, the boy band come on up. <laughs> uh. So next week we're going to pick up our study in chapter 11. But I hope this morning that through speaking about John and how the people responded to him and and seeing John's difficulty and struggles. You know, personally, I'll tell you my own personal thing here. I, I had great hopes for this last election that we had. Didn't you? Didn't some of you? I mean, how many times did we hear, man, oh boy, it's, oh man, it's going to change, right? People are going to come to their senses. And they didn't. So maybe God didn't hear our prayers. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe God says, you all deserve it. Or maybe my perception was just a little bit off. Maybe, like John in prison, things not working out the way he thought they would, maybe I need to step back and look at that and take a lesson from it and say, you are in control, Lord. Praise your name. It might not be going according to my plan, but I am not your counselor. I'm not your advisor. I'm your child, and I trust you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you, Lord, for the precious promises you give us. We want to thank you, Lord, that our future is bright, that we have eternal living hope in Christ this morning. And I want to pray for each one of us in here today. Lord, that you would light that fire in our spirit, that you would remind us who we are today, that you paid the ultimate price to purchase us for yourself, that you redeemed us from the market of slavery, that you paid the price. And now we belong to you and not ourselves. Help us, Lord, to live like that, to walk like that, Help us, Lord, to mature in that. And we thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. We thank you for your word, Lord, that truly does reach down into the very spirit of our being and change us from within. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.